the famous Hungarian national poet. Sander Petofi was one of the key figures in Hungary's quest for national independence in 1848. His composition Nemzeti Dal inspired a revolution in the Kingdom of Hungary that developed into a war for independence from the Austrian Empire. Petofi has a famous poem, Hope, that reads, Man, what is hope? A horrifying brothel girl who doles to everyone the same embrace. You waste on her your most precious possession, your youth, and then she leaves without a trace. Follow me and subscribe to my channel. Let's explore that hope like a brothel girl on ideas and myths by our no will. As we mentioned before, among the first generation of primitive gods in Greek mythology, Uranus, the god of the sky, and Gaia, the god of the earth, had six sons and six daughters, that is, the first titans. These six gods and six goddesses were married to each other and married to other gods, giving rise to the second generation of titans. Prometheus was born of the marriage of Iapetus, one of the first titans, and Themis, one of the first titanesses. Themis was also the second wife of Zeus. And Themis' husband, Prometheus' father Iapetus, was in turn the elder brother of Zeus' father Kronos. Iapetus is usually very calm, as calm as the setting sun. He specialized in fighting with spears and was known as the piercer. He once reluctantly aided Cronus in his patricide when he and his elder brothers Hyperion, Cias, and Creus together, at the four corners of the world, firmly pressed the limbs of Uranus. Their youngest brother, Cronos, cut off their father's phallus. The four of them represented the four pillars of the universe, with Iapetus being the pillar of the West. In the Titanomachy, the Titans were defeated by the Olympian gods, and Iapetus was imprisoned in the underground prison of Tartarus. At this time, the pillar of the West was Atlas, the son of Iapetus. Hesiod describes the earth, the oceans, and the sky as being in the void beneath the firmament of the universe, of which Atlas is the sustainer. Prometheus, son of Iapetus and elder brother of Atlas, had little respect for his cousin Zeus. But neither did he rebel against Zeus. He created man, not as a slave, but as a brother. As we have already said, Prometheus' brother, Epimetheus, the afterthought, is not only unable to see into the future, but in fact is unable to see into reality, which is a metaphor for the short-sightedness of mankind, so that Epimetheus can be identified as being the first man, even if he is not the first man. He represents the first man to marry the first woman, Pandora. Pyrrha, daughter of Epimetheus and Pandora, married Deucalion, son of Prometheus. In the great flood that punished mankind, only two people, Pyrrha and Deucalion, survived and became the ancestors of present-day mankind. Both Prometheus and Zeus were descendants of the Titans. Zeus, who challenged the Titans, became the new generation of Olympian gods who ruled the divine realm. Prometheus helped Zeus in the Titanomachy but was not rewarded with anything and was not able to enter Mount Olympus. Obviously, Zeus wanted to prevent this foresight threat, and Prometheus did not have a good feeling about Zeus. Knowing full well that the seeds of heaven lay dormant in the earth, he scooped up some clay, moistened it with river water, and kneaded it into a human body in the image of the world's lord. The god of heaven this man was his brother, and it was he who sought to create a secular race distinct from the Olympian gods. He expected that there would be a new world outside of the gods, and that man would be the ruler of this new world. And Athena, who helped Prometheus, was a rebel born from Zeus' forehead. Zeus' first wife was the goddess of wisdom or wise counsel, Metis. Metis was one of the 3,000 Oceanids born to the Titan, Oceanus, and the Titanites Thetis. Uranus and Gaia prophesied that the children born to Zeus and Myrtis would be wiser than their father. Fearful of being overthrown by his wiser offspring, Zeus tricked Metis into letting him swallow her. After being swallowed, Myrtis ran inside Zeus' head to build a suit of armor for his daughter, which gave Zeus such a headache that he summoned Hephaestus, the god of artisans and fire, who was born to him and his stepwife, Hera. Hephaestus cleaved Zeus' head with a labrys and a goddess. 
Athena, dressed in armor and holding up a golden spear, jumped out of Zeus' head. Zeus' head no longer hurt, but Hephaestus, the god of fire and craftsmen, began to ache because he had fallen in love with Athena. Because Hephaestus was so ugly, he was thrown off Mount Olympus by his mother Hera when he was born. Hephaestus tumbled through the air for a day and landed on the island of Lemnos. From then on he was a cripple and was mocked by the gods. Homer praises Athena for the moment when she jumped out of her father's head. The heavens and the earth shifted. Mount Olympus shook. The gods were awestruck by Athena's appearance and even Helios, the god of the sun, stopped his chariot in the sky. Athena, like Aphrodite, was a goddess without infancy, born into youthful maturity. Maybe it's adolescent rebellion. Athena helped Prometheus create man and injected a soul into man, an injection that necessarily represented Athena's spirit. Athena was a divine virgin who had not had sex with any god, which represented spiritual purity. Hephaestus tried to rape her but failed. Athena was the patron saint of heroes and was believed to have helped many of them, including Perseus, Heracles, Bellerophon, and Jason. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato wrote in Cratylus that That is a graver matter, and there, my friend, the modern interpreters of Homer may, I think, assist in explaining the view of the ancients. Most of these in their explanations of the poet assert that he meant by Athena mind and intelligence, and the maker of names appears to have had a singular notion about her, and indeed calls her by a still higher title, divine intelligence, as though he would say, This is she who has the mind of God. Perhaps, however, the name Theano may mean she who knows divine things better than others. Nor shall we be far wrong in supposing that the author of it wished to identify this goddess with moral intelligence, and therefore gave her the name Ethiano, which, however, either he or his successors have altered into what they thought a nicer form, and called her Athena. Prometheus deceives Zeus at Macon in defense of man's power. Like all foolish dictators, Zeus advertises that he is omnipotent has seen it all, and deliberately chooses the pile of oxen's bones. But instead of taking responsibility for his willfulness, he chooses to punish people. The trick at Macon is the first transaction between man and God. The trick at Macon is also a metaphor for man's rebellion against the gods from his very birth. And Zeus' disgust for man and all the punishments that followed were the means by which God controlled man. It is God's refusal to recognize man's separate place in the world. Epimetheus was a human incarnation who took Pandora as his wife. To celebrate their wedding, the gods sent numerous gifts. Of all the gifts, the most striking was an ornately decorated Pythos Pandora's box. The box was a gift from Zeus. Because Prometheus had instructed his brother not to accept any gifts from Zeus, Epimetheus did not open the box. One day when Epimetheus was out, Pandora was home alone. She was given to curiosity by Hera, so she could not resist the temptation to open the box. Whereupon greed, hypocrisy, slander, envy, disease, disaster, pain, etc. flew out. And Pandora, realizing that she was in trouble, hastened to close the box. At this point, the hope at the bottom of the box did not have time to fly out but remained there forever. Because the real hope was closed in the box, there was only falsehood wish in the world. The important German philosopher Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche gave an interpretation of this. Deuce just wants mankind, after suffering from all kinds of calamities and tribulations, to still hold on to false hope, so much so that he is willing to live on in the world, while continuing to endure the suffering of the world. Hope. Pandora brought the jar with the evils and opened it. It was the god's gift to man. On the outside a beautiful, enticing gift, called the lucky jar. Then all the evils, those lively, winged beings, flew out of it. Since that time, they roam around and do harm to men by day and night. One single evil had not yet slipped out of the jar. As Zeus had wished, Pandora slammed the top down and it remained inside. So now man has the lucky jar in his house forever and thinks the world of the treasure. It is at his service. He reaches for it when he fancies it. For he does not know that the jar which Pandora brought was the jar of evils. And he takes the remaining evil for the greatest worldly good, it is hope. For Zeus did not want man to throw his life away. No matter how much the other evils might torment him, 
but rather to go on letting himself be tormented anew. To that end, he gives man hope. In truth, it is the most evil of evils because it prolongs man's torment. When mankind had fire, mankind could be free of the gods and live in the earthly world under Mount Olympus as a parallel universe to the divine realm. But Zeus passed on all the suffering to the world. From then on, the war between mankind and the gods began a war to resist the curse of Zeus, to fight against suffering, and to hopefully overcome the fate imposed by the gods. Typical of Greek mythology is man's challenge to fate. Fate is what the gods have ordained, what the gods have punished man for. And while mankind has always been unable to resist fate, earthly heroes have never been willing to accept the fate set by the gods. The battle of fate is the hero's rebellion against the gods. Morai is the collective name of the three goddesses of fate and destiny in Greek mythology. Legend has it that within three days of a baby's birth, the three Morai will appear together to decide the baby's fate. The youngest sister Clotho, whose name means spinner, she spun the thread of human life. Her second sister, Lachesis, was responsible for drying out the thread of life. And her eldest sister, Atropos, was responsible for cutting it. The second sister, Lachesis, whose name means to be obtained by lot, by fate, or by the will of the gods. She measured the life length of the thread spun on the spindle of her sister Clotho. The eldest sister, Atropos, literally means inevitable, unavoidable. She ends the lives of mortals by cutting their lifelines. The three goddesses manage the threads of a person's destiny through weaving. Clotho, representing the future, weaves the threads of a person's life. The second sister, Lachesis, representing the present, measures and is responsible for the threads of life. And Atropos, representing the past, cuts the threads of life. It is Morai's duty to, to ensure that everyone, mortal and divine alike, lives their lives according to the destiny given to them by the laws of the universe. For mortals, this destiny runs throughout their lives, like threads spun from a spindle. Morai, as the enforcers of fate and destiny, are even considered to be above the gods. And although Zeus himself is subject to fate, as king of the gods, Zeus is able to command them. The three Morai are the daughters of the first primordial goddess Nyx, Conceived alone and without a father, they are also the sisters of curse, female death spirits, Thanatos, die, am dying, and Nemesis, the goddess of Ramnus, who personified retribution for the sin of hubris. Ananke is the god of inevitability, compulsion, and necessity in Greek mythology, portrayed as a goddess with a spindle. In Roman mythology, her name was Necessitas, and she was only portrayed in literature and not worshipped. The English word necessity is derived from this deity. Plato, in the Republic, considered her to be the mother of the Morai. Destiny is really the result of necessity and planning. In order to rule over man, God needs to run the world on the track of necessity through planning, while man is free to rebel against divinity and bring the world into the change of chance thus creating infinite possibilities for the future through evolution. Man's reverence for God represents the desire for order that exists in man's reason. Man's rebellion against God represents man's desire for freedom. Man's, representing freedom, belief in and resistance to God, the bondage, domination, is the contradiction between the desire for order and the choice of freedom. This contradiction has led to the constant confrontation in human society between equality and freedom, plan and market, dictatorship and republic, which constitutes the historical root of almost all the contradictory developments in human society, and to the constant swinging of the social order and the rights of the individual on the scales of humanity. To date, there is no end in sight to this confrontation. The confrontation between man and God, always with fewer victories and more defeats, has given rise to a particularly important concept in human values destiny. Back to the beginning of this article, on July 31, 1849, at Sejusvar, in present-day Romania, the Russian Imperial Fifth Army, commanded by General Alexander von Luders, fought the Battle of Sejusvar against the Hungarian Revolutionary Army, commanded by Joseph Saharyash Bem. 
who was fighting for freedom and independence. As adjutant of Lieutenant General Bem, Petofi returned to the army shortly before the battle. When in civilian clothes and unarmed, he went on foot from the battlefield to Hedges Falva, where he was probably killed by the Cossacks when he was last seen. The battle resulted in a victory for the Russians, who suppressed the independence movement. After the battle, a Russian army doctor recorded in his diary the death of Petofi, which should have been the best place for a heroic poet. But Petofi's body was never officially found. At the end of the 1980s, Soviet investigators discovered archives showing that some 1,800 Hungarian prisoners of war had been taken to Siberia after the battle. In 1990, an expedition traveled to Barguzin in Beriatia, Siberia, where archaeologists claimed to have found the skeleton of Petofi. There are also rumors that Petofi did not die, but only lost his faith in life, his revolutionary passion, and his enthusiasm for poetry, and let loose in the world. More Jokai, a friend of Petofi, a novelist, dramatist, and revolutionary who led the Hungarian Revolution of 1848, included this episode in his novel Political Fashion. A proverb is still circulating in Hungary. Belton min Petofi Akadbin disappeared like Petofi in the fog. Follow me and subscribe to my channel. Let's unravel the dark ages behind the world of myths. An idea and myths by Arno Will.